My name's Seth, by the way, one of the pastors here. And so as we begin the message today, I want to um, read some pretty lengthy quotes, okay? So I'm just giving you that as a heads up. We don't normally do this, but I really think it's going to set the stage as we talk about Christian, what it means to be Christian. If you're new to faith or new to church or haven't been to church in a long time, I hope this series is helpful to you and instructive to you. And, and even if you have been here for a while, I hope that this makes you think about faith in a new sort of way. Um, So about a year ago, one of my favorite Christian bands, a band named Cademan's Call, had a lead singer, Derek Webb, who left what we would call Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox just means um, kind of traditional Christianity. And I did a whole series on this about a year ago. It was called Adventure of a Lifetime. If you missed it, you can go to our church app and listen to it or our website and listen to it. But essentially what happened is Derek had an affair. He was married to another Christian singer, Sandra McCracken. So he had an affair. And it was as a result of his affair that he felt that the church was no longer a place for him. And it was really heartbreaking um, because their music has had a profound impact on my life, my own faith journey. And so I began investigating and I pulled up a podcast where he was interviewed in this podcast and I was listening to it again in relation to what we're talking about today and I just thought this is so, um, it, it paints an important picture for us. He talks about how the church responded to him when uh, news of his affair came out and how that uh, impacted him and his following of Christianity and Jesus. So here's, here's what he said. Again, it's a little bit lengthy, but he says, now it's showtime. I'm really needing them to show up and either be meaningful and comforting, either the ideas or the actual expression of the ideas, which is going to be the body, the church, the people. He goes on, he says, how's it all going to shake out now that the rubber's hitting the road? And it turns out that I'm not just a hypothetical sinner, I'm an actual one. Because the church loves when you talk about the idea of radical confession and really confessing your sins one to the other, and to really be open about that and get gritty, and really they love that in the hypothetical. But when you start doing it in the literal is when they start getting panicked. He goes on, he says, and when they start backing away and eventually excommunicating. I mean, it's like they really want you doing it, but then they want you doing it on their terms. And they want you doing it in a way that no one possibly could in a moment of crisis because you're not collected and you're trying to survive so you can't help the way it may come out of of you at any given time. And that's interestingly the point where the church really leaves a lot of folks. He says, which is so fascinating to me because it's like, well, isn't this what we've been practicing for? Isn't this what we've all been? We've all been rehearsing for this moment. And now that I'm going to come to you with more than just the idea that I'm a sinner, I'm going to come to you with like, oh, I actually am one. There is no escaping it anymore. And this is the moment. You would think that this would be the thing we've all been waiting for, and this is the thing we're built for, and now we're ready to drop me into the machine, and the machine does its thing. And I was like a wrench in the gears. And it's like it had to spit me right out. And it's like you, ironically, you stop making sense to the congregation when you start doing the one thing that apparently is the thing that everyone supposedly has in common there. And this is my favorite part, not really favorite, but you know what I mean by that. He says this. He says, it's like going to an AA meeting and getting kicked out when they find out that you're actually a drinker. It's like, I thought that's why we were all here. I thought that was the only thing we had in common and the reason we were gathering. So why are you shocked? And in Derek's own words, he wasn't looking for justification of what he did. He knew he created a mess. He knew that his sin was going to wreak havoc on his life. What was shocking to him was the response of the church. And his conclusion in those moments was to actually walk away from and leave Christianity. And in doing so, he started a podcast called The Airing of Grief. And I uncovered this podcast about it again. It was about a year ago. And it became like a slow motion train wreck for me where you can't look away, right? You see this horrible thing happening in front of your eyes and you can't look away. And so people would call in. They had 10-minute time slots that they could schedule with him. And he would record them and they would just share. They would kind of just unload 
about everything that was going on in their lives, their experience with Christians and Christianity, many people who were leaving Christianity because of addictions, uh, because uh, they had a, an affair or a spouse had an affair or they had gay friends who were just rejected by the church. And it's all these people who are wrestling, trying to make sense of the upside down Christian world they found themselves in, where Christians attempt to represent a version of Jesus that's seemingly nothing like the real thing. And I have heard many stories over the years. And what kills me about it is I, I, I experienced this at two levels. At one level, I nod in agreement like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you had to go through that. And at another level, I can be honest with myself and say, I can't believe I've been part of that. And I can't believe I've been responsible at times for other people experiencing that in such a way that is antithetical to the person of Jesus, all in the name of being Christian, all in the name of Christianity. There's a famous author named Anne Rice. Um, Anne Rice, who wrote The Interview with the Vampire, she sold nearly 100 million books. And she grew up Catholic, uh, moved toward being an atheist. And then in um, 1998, she had a conversion to Christianity. She wrote a couple of books um, about Jesus' life. One of those is called Christ the Lord. It's, it's, a, um, non, it's a fiction book that's meant to kind of retell Jesus' life. It's kind of a fascinating read if you're interested. But as she turned to Christianity, eventually, after about a decade, she ended up turning away from Christians in Christianity. And she posted this on her Facebook, and this is so, so fascinating. Here's what she said. Today, I quit being a Christian. I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being Christian or to being part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile disputatious, which I didn't even know was a word till I read this, disputatious and deservedly infamous group. She goes on, she says, my conscience will allow nothing else. My faith in Christ is central to my life. My conversion from a pessimistic atheist lost in a world I didn't understand to an optimistic believer in a universe created and sustained by a loving God is crucial to me. She goes on, she says, but following Christ does not mean following his followers. Christ is infinitely more important than Christianity and always will be, no matter what Christianity is, has been, or might become. She says, my commitment to Christ remains at the heart and center of my life. Transformation in him is radical and ongoing. That I feel now that I am called to be an outsider for him, to step away from the words Christian and Christianity is something that my conscience demands of me. She says, some of you know the tension of wanting a connection with God through Christ, but being icked out by religion, church, people who guilt you to death and seem to want more from you than for you. She did not quit Jesus. She didn't quit following him. She just quit Christianity, which plays into that Airing of Grief podcast. And it also plays into something Brennan Manning, this priest scholar, author, who wrote a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel. He says, speaking of an account of a person talking to God, Manning wrote this. He said, the story goes that a public sinner was excommunicated and forbidden entry to the church. He took his woes to God. They won't let me in, Lord, because I'm a sinner. What are you complaining about, said God? They won't let me in either. (laughs) How is that possible? In the name of Jesus. How is it possible that this has been done in the name of Christianity? So we're going to talk about that today. Last week we began unpacking the concept of the word Christian, the word Christian, and we've been talking about how, if we can get that slide up there, if we, we've been talking about Christians and the whole idea that there's no definition of the word Christian in the New Testament. As we kind of unpack the New Testament and open the pages and read through it, there's actually only three times when the word Christian is used, and the history and the origin of the word Christian actually comes from Greek-speaking people who discovered there was this body of people who loved to 
follow this guy named Christ. They thought that was his last name. Surprise, it's not. It's not Joseph Christ and Mary Christ had Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. It means Messiah. And so there's this group of followers who believed that this Messiah had died and come back to life and that they found life in him. And they began spreading that across the Roman world. And so as people came to find out, they're like, oh, it just these people are associated with Christ. That's what the word Christian means, associated with Christ. But because there's no real definition of Christian in the Bible and in the New Testament, there's also a lack of understanding of what exactly that means. And so we attach Christian to all kinds of things. There are bumper stickers that say, Jesus is my savior. Uh, Trump is my president. There are people who say, I'm a Christian and I could never vote for Trump because I find him reprehensible. There are Christians on both sides of just about every single debate, whether it's wearing masks during COVID, whether it's race relations, whether it's political things or world things. It explains why predominantly Christian countries can go to war against one another, and it explains why our predominantly Christian country could go to war with itself about 150 years ago during the Civil War. The term Christian was imposed on people, and it was used negatively, kind of like freaks and geeks, right? It wasn't cool to be a geek until you learned you could make money going into people's homes and helping them fix their technology stuff, right? Instead, there was a different term used. It was a different term that was invitational, and yet it was unsettling, and it was scary. These people called themselves what Jesus called them, which was disciples, disciples. Now, nobody introduces themselves as like disciple, right? If I were to introduce myself to you, I don't know you, I'm disciple Seth. And you're like, I'm leaving. That's awkward and I don't feel good about this. this, this it, that's like just uncomfortable, right? And, and maybe one of the reasons why it's uncomfortable is because this term disciple is so terrifyingly clear. I mean, Jesus meant no words of what it meant to be one of his disciples. And the New Testament authors, as they began outlaying, as people became disciples, right? It, it requires an honest inward look. You can't just attach disciple onto yourself without becoming a learner, an apprentice, one who says, I'm going to understand who you are, and I'm going to do what you said to do. So last week, um, we looked at Jesus' kind of New Testament words that were helpful in defining what a disciple is. And, and basically, Jesus, in his final days, says, hey, guys, I've got a new command for you. If you're going to be one of my disciples, you need to make sure that you do this. And I know there are a whole bunch of commands, and you, you know, 613 Jewish laws that people had to memorize and know, and they weren't very good at memorizing and knowing them, because that's a lot. So he's like, no, if you can't figure out anything else, I just want you to do this one thing. And so we're going to relook at what Jesus said there. And then we're going to look into something else that was said by one of his New Testament followers, John, the apostle John. And before we do that, though, I want to acknowledge that these words that Jesus spoke, I mean, they can come across as a little bit passive, a little bit weak um, men, right? We, we could look at this and say, these, these don't seem very manly, and I know in our world, right, we don't like talking about manly because there's toxic masculinity, whatever that is. And, and so there's a little bit of, oh, we're okay with not manly. Some of us, not all of us. And, and I mean, we can be honest, there's toxic masculinity. There can also be toxic feminine, and femin however you pronounce that. Feminine. <laughs> there can be toxic women, okay? We'll just say that. <laughs> okay, it goes across the board. It's not just one or the other. And so as we go through this, I mean, guys, it, it's easy to respond with like, well, that's great for for the church, but I don't know if that works in the real world. And I think maybe the reason why you might think that way is because when you envision Jesus, you tend to envision Jesus like this. I mean, this was on the walls of churches, it's on walls of homes, and maybe you've seen this portrait before. This is not a particularly good depiction of Jesus. Anything that's white <laughs> is not a particularly good depiction of Jesus. But if you want to know what Jesus meant by what he said, you should look at how Jesus responded. If you want to know what he meant and how to employ what it was that he said, then you should look at how he treated other people. And the thing that we can't miss with Jesus is to remember that he was 30 years old when he entered into Jerusalem, roughly 30 years old when he entered into Jerusalem for the last time. And he knew when he entered into that city that he would be unfairly tried. False witnesses and all, they would come up against him. And he knew that he would be unjustly crucified, 
right? And instead of cowering in fear, which is what he could have done, because most of us wouldn't want to face death the way that he faced death. In fact, this is a man who grew up seeing Roman corpses or rotting corpses on Roman crosses. It wasn't just a theory to him. He didn't see it on television. He didn't hear people talk about it. His mother shielded him from seeing it. He smelled it. He heard it. He had probably seen hundreds of crucifixions in his time. And when he entered into that city that last time, he knew what his fate would be. He had countless opportunities to flee, to get away, to recant, and he never did it. In fact, the night that he was betrayed, he gathered the 11 together who were left, right? One had run to go ahead and betray him, and he knew Judas was going to be coming with his army in just a few short hours. And he gathered his guys together, and he said, guys, if you forget everything else I told you, do not forget this one thing. By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. To which we're like, oh, I thought it's about what I believe, Jesus. Isn't that what's most important, that I believe the right things and I pray the right prayers and and then I'm in? The problem is nobody sees our beliefs, right? Nobody knows what's going on in our little heads. I've never been able, very good at reading people's minds and um, you're probably not very good at reading my mind, right? I mean, that that doesn't work that way. And so Jesus says, no, it it comes down to how we out, our outward behaviors, our actions, And guys, I know it's hard, but this is the most important thing. This is how they'll know you're my disciples. Like, this is the defining factor. And so 55 years or so after this, the Apostle John, right, who wrote this, John is an old man at this point in time, so he's kind of fast forward almost half a century. He has lived through so much. Think about everything he's lived through. There's the ransacking of Jerusalem, the the. Um, city of Jerusalem ransacked by Titus. He's seen thousands of people crucified. He's seen the temple destroyed stone by stone so that there is no way that Jewish people can ever um, honor their religion and offer a sacrifice at the temple any longer. He saw Peter taken to Rome or heard of Peter being taken to Rome where he was crucified. And tradition tells us that he was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy of dying the same way his savior had died. He knew about Paul going to Rome, being imprisoned and eventually being taken outside of the city and beheaded. Unbeknownst to him of why it was reality, he was probably the last one left. He knew of countless followers of Jesus' disciples who had been killed, who had been murdered, who had been dispersed for their faith. He had seen the changes of the Roman Empire. He had lived through Caligula, who was the emperor when Jesus was crucified. He lived through, um, or Tiberius rather was the emperor. He lived through Caligula. He lived through Nero. He saw the holy city um, destroyed and Jewish people not even allowed to re-enter it. Tradition tells us that he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, to Ephesus, where he cared for her and watched over her. And so in his old age, he wrote this letter to followers of Jesus who were part of this dispersion, who weren't even allowed to meet in homes together publicly, lest somebody become aware of what they were doing. And so just imagine if you were one of the recipients of these letters. I mean, this is John, the last living person who knew Jesus personally, who raced Peter to the empty tomb and beat him there and peered inside and just saw the grave clothes, who had breakfast with Jesus on the beach, who was with him when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the John we're talking about. And John could write anything he wants in this letter to these Christians as an encouragement to them. And look at what he writes here. He says, dear friends, which is actually not a good translation. A better translation of this word is beloved. In fact, he's making kind of a play on words. So you're going to see here in just a minute. He says, beloved, let us love one another. Those of you who are loved, let us love one another for love comes from God. To which you kind of want to pause and say, really, John, (laughs) haven't you moved on from love yet? I mean, (laughs) how how has love worked out for you? How has love worked out for Peter and for Paul? How did love work out for James, the half-brother of Jesus? 
I mean, how, how has love worked for all these, these Christians who are dispersed, who aren't allowed to even be public about what they believe? How has love been? I'm not sure love is working. Like, maybe we need to do something different. But he says, no, no, no. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. And then he goes on, he says, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That the way you and I know someone is godly and that someone knows God is that they love. It's what Jesus said in the garden, right? Love one another. That's how they're going to know that you're my disciples, if you love one another. He goes on, he says, whoever does not love does not know God, which sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Because you can think of somebody, I mean, you can think of somebody who's like, you know, she was a great Bible teacher. You didn't want to talk to her one-on-one because she's a little rough around the edges, but I mean, she could really teach the Bible. I mean, she's got to know God, right? So he's a great preacher. You should hear his sermons. I don't want to introduce you to him because, you know, he's kind of a jerk. But I mean, you know, you should hear the sermons, right? And, and, but John's like, no, that's not how it works. If they don't have love, then they don't know God. And that sounds kind of harsh, but here's why John would say, I can confidently say that because he says, because God is love. Now, if you were out and about, Kroger, Walmart, wherever, out and about, and somebody says, would you just tell me about God? What do you know about God? Most of us would respond to that with a lot of, especially if you grew up in church, you got the omni words, like omnipotence, you know, omnipresence, uh, you know, he's, all, the, all the words we sing about. He's the creator, provider, redeemer, friend. He's mighty, he's powerful, he's awesome, right? We've got all these grand kind of words to use to describe God, and yet John says, let me tell you the character, the nature, the essence of God, and that's that he is love. Like, that's the main thing. Say, well, John, how can you conclude that? Well, here's how. He says this. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. Now, I hope you read your Bible. You should read your Bible if you don't. You know, beyond Sunday morning, you should read your Bible and pull it out. And one of, the, one of the challenges when you read your Bible is we read it to finish rather than reading it to change, right? Just to check it off a list so we can say, oh, I'm done, I did that. And when we read it to finish, sometimes we can just breeze past stuff. And there's something really important here that we can just breeze past. Because look at this again. He says, this is how God showed his love among us. John says, let me take you back. And us, just so you know, is not us, us. It's John, us. It's the 12 us. It's the people who knew Jesus, us. He says, let me take you back 55 years ago or so, back when Jesus was still on the earth and I was one of the 12. And I traveled with him and I watched how he interacted with people and I saw him heal people and I I listened to him preach and, and I saw him perform miracles and I experienced him. He says, I'll never doubt the love of God because of what I saw. And here it is. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That's what I saw. That's what I experienced. That's what I know. And then he says this. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, this is not a trick question. Who do you think us and our are? Us and our are you and me and the entire world. Everyone on the planet including your mother-in-law, which I feel bad <laughs> even making jokes about because I have a great mother-in-law, right? I mean, that's, I feel bad every time I, I use that. But I mean, you, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, whoever, your, the neighbor whose animal like, you know, uses the, your lawn as a bathroom and it's so frustrating, right? The team's coach who won't stop yelling at the kids. And you're just like, dude, chill out. Or, or the parents from the other team who won't stop yelling at the kids. And you're like, take him out, right? Get the umpire to take, take him out or the ref to take him out, right? The never Trump people, the always Trump people, the MAGA people, the drivers who give you that nice job when they cut you off on the interstate, right? The customer service person who doesn't seem to understand the word service as part of his or her title. All of those people, all of those people, everyone, the yous around you, the people you're in contact with, the people you go to school with and work with, the annoying people, the wonderful people, all of those people is an us and an R. 
And he uses this word atoning, which is a big religious word. He says he loved us and he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. That means he paid the sin debt that we all owe to God. He was the perfect sinless sacrifice for sins that we needed so we could be forgiven. He goes on, he says, dear friends, again, this is beloved, beloved, since God so loved us, we also ought. Now, the word ought is um, it's kind of a, a legal term. It's used in a legal requirement here, as in we have an obligation. We have an indebtedness. We owe it with everyone. And here's what we owe to every other person on the planet, all the us's and ours on the planet. We ought, we owe it to love one another. Now, here's an interesting question. Who do we owe it to? Do we owe it to them? No. You know who we owe it to? God. Because he so loved me, I don't like you, but I'm called to love you. And because he so loved you, you may not like me, but you're called to love me in return. You owe it to me. I owe it to you. And the person around us who is unlovable doesn't give us the freedom from obligation because we don't love that person because they deserve to be loved. The whole point is that I'm indebted to God. And I want to be really clear. This is not about me earning anything. It's not about you earning anything. That's not the point. That's not what Jesus is getting at or what John's getting at. It's not about earning something because there is nothing that we could possibly earn The idea is that what God did for me is so extraordinary. There is no way I could possibly pay it back. And thank goodness God is not asking me to pay it back because I never could pay it back. But what he's asking me to do is to pay it forward by loving those around me, the world around me. God does not need anything from me. There is nothing that I could give to God that would somehow impress him or somehow give him something that he doesn't already have. What he wants is for the watching world to see the way that we love and to recognize that we are different, that there is something unique here. We are not disputatious and hostile. (laughs) We're his disciples. But to do this, we have to embrace the command that he gave us to love one another. And man, I tell you what, when I think about Derek Webb, when I think about Anne Rice, when I think about countless others who air their grief, and quite honestly, a piece of you know, my job is I get a front row seat of hearing many of your stories and hearing about your experience with the church. And do you know the common thread that wasn't a part of any of those stories? And one of the things that I have never, ever heard I have never heard that the church was too loving, so I just had to get out. I've never heard someone say, they are too nice, it makes me sick. I just, oh my gosh, why did they have to be so kind to me? They're too, they're too honest, you know, I want them to lie to me. I want them to, you know, be deceptive and dishonest. They're, they're too generous, they won't stop giving me stuff. Why do they want to give me stuff all the time? They're, they're too forgiving, they're too patient, they're too humble. They admit their failures and ask for forgiveness. They don't wait for me to find out when they've screwed up, right? They're so selfless. They're just always looking to the needs of other people. Oh, it drives me crazy. They bent over backwards for me. Why would anybody quit too loving? They wouldn't. I mean, the gravitational pull of that is too strong. It's, it's almost like it's irresistible. Maybe that's Jesus' point. And John's point. And that when disciples do this, it can have a profound impact on the world around them. But I tell you what, do you know what I have heard? I've heard the opposite of that. I've heard they were so judgmental. I had a guy come up to me after the Greensburg service today. He admitted to me that he had had an affair 15 years ago and the church kicked him out. And he wasn't admitting that it was okay he needed healing. He needed people to come wrap their arms around him, but they, they wouldn't do it. They point fingers. They act as though they're perfect. They treat me badly. They talk behind my back. 
Those Christians are terrible tippers. I've heard that one before. Uh, They leave tracks. Um, (laughs) They're disrespectful. They're dishonest, right? I mean, they take advantage. They argue on social media. Everything's political. They just gossip. They just backbite. That's Christians. Years ago, I had a friend, a very close friend. I don't have permission to share this story, so I'll keep it a little bit vague. But my friend had really long hair. Uh, really long hair that would make some of you ladies jealous, right? I mean, you know, he had good hair. And uh, one day he was sitting in a computer lab and a guy came up from behind and kissed him because he thought it was his girlfriend. That led him to cut his hair. Okay, so that's another story for another time because it was like that crossed some lines. But I'll never forget going into a Christian bookstore with this person and the ladies behind the counter started just like talking about him and uh, you know, when he, he had nice long hair and he carried himself a little bit like a skater. And so they just had a lot of assumptions. And, and one day uh, after he had cut his hair, he was at a wedding um, reception and the youth pastor's wife from our church was sitting at a table. It was him um, and, and his fiance. And the youth pastor's wife said to his fiance, did he ever tell you about his past? He didn't have a past. Like he didn't have a past. He just had long hair and he <laughs> liked his long hair. <laughs> But the church, I mean, and, and, and what I saw is this person, you know, not completely separating himself from the church, but stepping back. And I just think, what have we done? That's what Christians do. But let's not be Christians. Let's be disciples. See, what John the apostle was saying is that a disciple recognizes because he, so must we. Because he loved us so must we love others. What about when someone's unlovable? Doesn't matter. Jesus never allowed the behaviors and the the actions of other people to drive his own behaviors and actions. He did what he needed to do, what was consistent within his character. And so in those moments, just remind yourself, I don't owe them, I owe him because he has done so much for me. I and mean, can you just imagine if, if Christians were known, not for pointing their fingers, not for backbiting, not for any of the things that Christianity has become known for, but if we began loving our community, loving our family, loving our enemies, loving those within the walls of our church, those with outside the walls of the church, loving our country, What an invitation. He went first. And now I'm following. And I just have to believe that when we do this, people realize that they're feeling not coerced, right? Nobody's forcing them into anything. Nobody's making them think they're sinners in the hands of an angry God. They feel drawn. They feel drawn. It's inspirational and it's convicting because they recognize there's something different. The guy who has a Christian employee disciple employee, you know, I don't know if we can use the word Christian anymore after this series, but you know, you, you get what I'm talking about. It's hard to change your vernacular, but you know, it's like, man, they're so honest, right? She came to me when she messed up. I was going to fire her because I thought she'd hide it, but she just told the truth and I'm not even that honest. Or I see their marriages and I just think, wow, they have worked through so much and that I want a marriage like that. There's just something different in the way that they have marriages. Or that, that Christian kid asked my, my daughter out and he treats her like a princess. I've never, I, I don't even treat her that well, right? And I know what I was like as a teenage boy, I wouldn't have treated a girl that well, but I hope, I hope she falls in love with him and marries him. Or I hear how generous they are. Did you hear they, they changed the, car, the oil in 200 cars and they did it for free and they, they're just so generous. There's something so unique about it. What an invitation and an opportunity to draw people into the presence of our Lord and Savior. It's what drew me. It's probably what drew you. I, I don't know about your church upbringing. Maybe, maybe you didn't have any, but generally because of our, our churches and who we attract here, I mean, m- most of us have some kind of a church upbringing. And it's in our upbringings. It's not the rules and the laws that kept us coming back, was it? In fact, many times that's what repelled us. It was the people who wrapped their arms around us and said, I care about you. I want to love you in your imperfect state. I don't want to love you to keep you there. In fact, next week we're going to go into that a little bit more. I don't want to love you to keep you there, but I care for you. And I want to love you. 
And that's what keeps people coming back. When you say, you're part of this community. We're going to wrap our arms around you, and we're going to get through this together. We're going to move forward together. Whatever you've been through, whatever you've done, God has something so good for us. Man, I tell you what, when we take that approach, there will be fewer quitters like Derek Webb, and there will be people aching to come in and to be a part of a community of disciples who follow Jesus' Jesus' command to love one another because he so must we. Let's love as he loved. We're going to pick it up there next week. I hope you'll be back. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, in some ways it's easier to talk about than it is to do. Um, And yet the invitation isn't just for us to talk about it, it's to do it. To go out into our communities, into our, our homes, into our neighborhoods, in our church family, and to love as you loved us. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us wisdom to know what we need to do with that. In those situations where we come across somebody who's unlovable, and that's not our immediate response, and yet it's what you want from us and for us. And so give us wisdom, give us courage to do it. God, I pray for the person in the room or watching online who it's possible they, they were icked out by the church. And God, I, I just hate the fact knowing that I've been part of icking people out. Would we not be that place and would you take that person who has just felt that and bring them back to a place of, of hope knowing that this is an environment where they can seek to draw near to you. God, would we be an environment of grace and love and belief that you have something good in store for us. Guide us, Father, and give us courage, and help us to do what you've commanded us to do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.